Hello, students, and welcome back to History of Medicine. This week, we're going to begin a multi-part series of lectures focusing on the rise and spread of modern Western medicine, which is also known as biomedicine. The term biomedicine is often used to refer to the medical theories and practices of Western societies. As the name suggests, this is a medicine that derives from an understanding of biology, specifically biological processes within the human body. Biomedicine is typically distinguished from the medicine of non-Western societies. Indeed, we tend to see biomedicine as the opposite of ethnomedicine. Whereas ethnomedicine is based on cultural beliefs, we say, biomedicine is based on science. It is value-neutral, rational, and evidence-based. It constitutes the triumph of reason over superstition, fact over belief, data over dogma, objectivity over subjectivity, and accuracy over error. It alone is true, we say, and it alone works. Everything else is just misunderstanding. But is this how we should see things? Biomedicine often presents itself as a culture of no culture, but is this true? Is biomedicine entirely divorced from culture, or is biomedicine just another kind of ethnomedicine? If it is, what are the cultural beliefs, values, and rules that it's built upon? What set of interests, emotions, and biases have informed the cultural construction of biomedicine? And where do these come from? This week in class, we're going to address these questions. However, before getting to these things, it would help to first attend to some more basic historical questions. For example, when did biomedicine come into existence? Where did it first emerge? And what forces and factors helped bring it into being? These are the questions I'm going to address in this lecture. Modern Western medicine, as we're going to see, came into being as a part of transformations that rippled through European societies from around 1750 through the early 1800s. During these 50 or so years, the most important developments in Western Europe were, first, the scientific revolution, and second, the French Revolution. Both had a profound impact on medicine. Taken together, these events shook the Hippocratic Galenic foundations of European medicine and replaced them with a more mechanistic view of the body and a more localized understanding of disease. Now, the scientific revolution, as you probably know, is commonly associated with individuals like Isaac Newton, discoverer of the laws of gravity. Inspired by Newton, doctors of the late 1700s began to seek out the laws governing health and disease. And just as Newton conceived of the universe as a machine, so too did doctors start envisioning the body as a machine, a thing that consisted of gears, levers, and pulleys. They saw diseases in a similar fashion and set out to classify them according to their symptoms. Thus emerged the field of nosology, one of its creators was the Scottish physician William Cullen. In 1769, Cullen, who was a professor at Edinburgh University, published a nosology textbook that divided diseases into four basic types, as you can see on the screen. This might seem like a very crude way to categorize diseases, but at the time, it was quite innovative. Cullen's nosology represented a break with the Hippocratic tradition, which, if you'll remember, was based on the theory of the four humors. Hippocratic medicine was more concerned with sick individuals than with disease in and of itself. Indeed, within the Hippocratic tradition, disease did not really even exist, and symptoms were less important to doctors than the humoral imbalances believed to produce those symptoms. This is why Hippocratic healers would often give people with the same symptoms totally different remedies. The idea that diseases produce common symptoms in people 
regardless of their age, their gender, their geographical location, or their previous medical history, was totally alien to Hippocratic medicine. Because in Hippocratic medicine, every body is different. The work of 18th century physicians like Cullen changed all of that. Now, increasingly, the focus of medicine was not sick bodies, but instead diseases, which were understood as things that exist independently of the people who suffer from them. Essentially, what we are talking about here is a shift in etiological concepts. Etiology is a medical term that refers to our ideas about the causes of illness. Up until the 18th century, what prevailed within the West were physiological etiologies. This is the idea that disease is something that arises from within the body. By contrast, ontological etiologies present disease as an external agent, that is, as something that comes from outside the body, like bacteria, viruses, or environmental toxins. The ontological viewpoint was totally absent in Hippocratic medicine. While Hippocratic doctors acknowledged that things like climate could be harmful to one's health, they believed that this would only happen to someone with a pre-existing humoral imbalance. Thus, the idea that certain groups of symptoms could be spoken of as diseases that affected people regardless of their physical constitutions was wholly unknown to the Hippocratics. It only emerged in the 18th century when Western medicine witnessed a shift from physiological explanations of illness to ontological ones. If the scientific revolution uprooted Western medicine's intellectual foundations, the French Revolution destroyed its organizational basis. The French Revolution began in 1789, and it had a profound impact on countries all across Europe, most of which actively opposed the new French government and tried to overthrow it. In 1792, France's enemies formally banded together to mount an invasion of the country, and in response to this, the revolutionary French regime did something truly revolutionary. It created the first citizen army in history. For the first time, adult men with no prior military experience were en masse conscripted into the army, which quickly grew to over one million soldiers. So as to preserve the lives of these soldiers, the government also began conscripting doctors and started heavily investing in hospitals. Recognizing that this would not be enough, it also began training medical students. In 1794, the Paris School of Medicine was created. Because the government wanted to get these students into battlefield medicine as quickly as possible, it created a curriculum that was totally clinical in nature and that privileged hands-on training over book learning. As one of the creators of the new school put it, quote, reading little, seeing and doing much, this will be the basis of the new teaching. So as to provide medical students with as much practical experience as possible, the French government also prioritized the hospital as a site of medical education. Indeed, hospitals now became doctor factories. Some of the era's most famous doctors became hospital employees, where they both taught and conducted research. Among them was Xavier Bichat, an army surgeon who moved to Paris in 1794. Working in a hospital gave Bichat ample opportunity to dissect the bodies of soldiers who had died from illness or injury, and on the basis of post-mortem investigations, he published a number of books that served as the basis for educating medical students. In these books, Bichat devoted a lot of attention to pathological anatomy, and in particular, to the kinds of morbid changes he had seen in his patients' tissues. He actually identified several new kinds of tissue. More importantly, his methods helped bring into existence an entirely new style of medicine, something we call 
Paris medicine. Paris medicine had three basic components. One, detailed physical examinations of a patient throughout the course of their illness. Two, autopsies, which were conducted if a patient died and which were done so as to help doctors discover the relationship between specific symptoms and different kinds of organic lesions. And three, statistics, which were compiled to determine how effective different kinds of treatments or interventions were. In addition to Bichat, another key representative of Paris medicine was René Lenac. Lenac was actually one of the first students trained at the new Paris School of Medicine, and after graduating, he worked as a surgeon in a number of different military hospitals. By 1801, he was a recognized expert in pathological anatomy, and in 1816, he became the chief physician at the Necker Hospital in Paris. Like Bichat, Lenec was intensely interested in doing autopsies, and while at the Necker Hospital, he introduced the procedure he is best known for, auscultation. As legend has it, he stumbled upon this one day by accident when he used a rolled-up paper towel to listen to the chest of a female patient. To his surprise, he found that this paper towel roll greatly improved his ability to hear inside a patient's chest. Hoping that these sounds could be correlated with lesions discovered during post-mortem examinations, he then developed a new medical instrument, the stethoscope. This device enabled Lenac to differentiate between a variety of respiratory ailments on the basis of the distinctive sounds they produce within the chest. And the stethoscope also helped him correlate these sounds with the lesions he found in patients' lungs after they died. On the basis of these findings, in 1821, he published his Treatise on the Diseases of the Chest. Discoveries like this made Paris medicine all the rage. Between the 1820s and 1850s, aspiring medical doctors from all across Europe and North America flocked to Paris in order to study with clinicians like Bichat and Lenec. And because of this, the technologies and techniques associated with Paris medicine spread throughout the West. By 1850, medical professionals all across the West were convinced that Hospital experience was essential to medical training, that physical diagnosis had to be coupled with autopsy, and that medical statistics were crucial to the improvement of medical and surgical interventions. And with the spread of Paris medicine, both the Western medical body and Western understandings of disease were fundamentally altered. The stage for the development of modern biomedicine was set. One of the many foreign medical students who made their way to Paris during the early 1800s was James Surridge. In 1834, Surridge, who was then a student at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland, traveled to Paris, where he remained for a year. During his time there, he attended lectures, received hands-on instruction in clinics and hospitals, and also paid for private instruction. Most importantly for us, Surridge also kept a diary during his time in Paris, and from this we can get a good sense of what it was like to experience all of the exciting medical innovations coming out of the French capital at this time. Later in the week, we're going to use Surridge's diary to learn more about Paris medicine, but for now, let's keep things on a more general level. Please take a look back at the questions on slide two. And once you've assembled some preliminary thoughts on the whole is biomedicine ethnomedicine question, please head over to our discussion forum and share them with your classmates. Let's exoticize the familiar. I'm really looking forward to seeing what you have to say about this, and we'll see you on the discussion board.